Today we will be reading and singing the Psalter from him, uh, Psalm 46. I will sing the refrain first. It's a very simple little tune. And we'll do it one more time with everyone joining in. And then as indicated in your order of worship, when it says refrain, please join in the refrain with me and the choir. You'll notice the word selah after the passages. That indicates a short pause, so I will be doing that as well. and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. Behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to an end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the fields with fire. Be still and I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Be still and know that I am 
how we desperately need to be able to proclaim it is well with my soul and believe it. Without the wellness of our souls, the world will remain soul sick. And the soul cannot be seen as something singular or set apart. It is connected and intertwined with everything and everyone. The wellness of our souls depends upon us understanding the source of our soul. In trying to define the soul, Quaker writer and teacher Parker Palmer says, soul is a word that must be held lightly because it points toward a mystery, a mystery for which nobody has the true name. Every tradition has a different name for it. The Hasidic Jews call it the spark of the divine in every human being. Buddhists call it the big self sometimes, that's self with a capital S. Christian monk Thomas Merton called it the true self. My tradition, the Quakers, he says, we tend to call it the inner light, the inner teacher. All of these are synonyms for the same thing, and what that thing is, no one really knows. <laughs> The best I can do, he says, is to say it is the being in human being. And what we call it doesn't matter so much, but that we call it something matters a lot. Because when we fail to name it, we're more likely to treat each other like objects to be manipulated, empty vessels to be filled with somebody else's agenda, or as I would add, if we don't name it, then we become desensitized and numb, and we start killing and destroying and demeaning and dehumanizing. Parker Palmer continues, since the soul itself is a mystery that nobody has a name for, the closest thing we can do to talk about it is to have an image or a metaphor. And the metaphor that I've landed on that's been helpful to me is this. The soul is very much like a wild animal. On the one hand, a wild animal has the capacity to survive in the deep, dark woods, in very difficult places, places where there's hardly anything to eat. A wild animal has strength and resilience and a kind of wiliness, he says. And it's this kind of deep knowing about survival that the human soul has as well and on which the human soul depends. I mean, anybody who's been through a really tough situation knows what it means to say, I don't know what it was, but something inside of me allowed me to keep going. Something beyond myself helped me put one foot in front of the other. So he says the soul has this strength, but at the same time, just like a very wild animal, the soul is very shy. We know that if we want to see a wild animal, the last thing we should do is run crashing into the woods, yelling and screaming for it to come out. What we need to do is walk into the woods quietly, sit at the base of the tree, breathe with the earth for a while, and eventually the thing we seek may put in an appearance. And if it does, we may only catch it out of the corner of our eye, but to see something so original, so wild, so natural, so elemental, I think for most of us, he says, is to never forget it. Unfortunately, community in our culture too often means a group of people who go crashing through the woods together, scaring the soul away, even as we say that we're searching for it. In spaces ranging from congregations to classrooms, we preach, teach, assert, argue, claim and proclaim, admonish and advise, and generally behave in ways that drive everything original and wild about us into hiding. 
Now, under these conditions, things like the emotions and the will and the ego, those all emerge, but not the soul. We scare off the soul. A true community of trust is a group of people who know how to sit quietly in the woods with each other and wait for the shy soul to show up. In such a space, we're freed to hear our own truth to touch what brings us joy, to become self-critical about our faults, to forgive ourselves for all the ways our egos demand privilege and power, and to take risky steps toward change, knowing that we'll be accepted no matter what. Given all this that Parker Palmer has said, it seems to me that a key part of being well with our souls is to do whatever we can to remind ourselves of the sacred being within each of us and all of us. And this is essential, especially at a time when entire groups of people are being portrayed as subhuman and treated as such especially at a time when it's easier to kill each other than to sit down and have a conversation about that which conflicts and divides. So what can we do to remind ourselves of the sacred being in each one of us? Well, we can listen to the one who created the sacred being in each of us, the source of our soul. We can get past our temporary circumstances here and now and tune in to an eternal reality of who we are and whose we are, always and forever. And we can hold on to the imago dei, the image of God in each and every person, have a tight grip on it, hold it with all that we have as if everything in the world depended upon it because just maybe it does. And this is not to say that life is not hard or that the troubles of the world are not very, very real. Rather, it's to say that in and through this reality, there is a truth that stands. God is our refuge, our strength, a very present help. We need not fear because God is God and God is with us. The only thing we have to be afraid of is when we and others start thinking we are God, which happens all too often. You know, this is the illusion that plagues our soul health to think that somehow we are more powerful, we are more knowing, or maybe even that God really does have favorites and we're one of them. Psalm 46 destroys this illusion. It stills us into the truth of God's presence in the midst of our chaotic circumstances and wretched reality. It does not dismiss our troubles. It names them and then proclaims something more true and deep, the steadfast presence of the Lord, a presence which cannot be lost or pushed aside no matter what problems or terrors we face. So let's break it down a bit and put some modern language to it. God is our refuge. God is the impenetrable bomb shelter in war, the enclosed car we dash to in a downpour, the hotel bed we collapse into after a long day of travel, the closet we hide in when things are scary at night, the lover who holds us when we need to feel safe, our refuge. God is our strength. God is the outstretched arm that catches us when we're about to trip. God is the friend across the coffee table when we're in crisis. The confidence that we feel when we've accomplished something big. The liquid IV that flows through our veins when we're dehydrated. The trainer lifting up the weight that we've taken on that's too heavy for us to lift on our own. Our strength. God is a very present help. 
God is the umbilical cord that feeds us, the voice at the end of the 988 hotline, the doctor in the emergency room available 24-7, the oxygen of each of our inhales, the pulsing of each of our heartbeats, the ground beneath our feet, and maybe even the golden retriever puppy that follows us everywhere in our house. God is very present. And in times of trouble, we know about times of trouble, don't we? Times of trouble, times of war, when Hamas terrorists fire rockets into Israel in an unprecedented attack, and when Israel retaliates declaring war, when hostages have been taken and children have been killed and citizens and soldiers are dying by the hour and Israeli cities are in lockdown and the Gaza Strip is in ruins, when Russia launches a missile strike on a Ukrainian village this week that is the deadliest attack on civilians since the invasion began, killing 51 people in five minutes, Natalia told me, including a child. And when millions of people from Sudan have been displaced just in the last six months, fleeing for their lives, refugees again for the second, third, or fourth time in their lives, in times of trouble, in times of trouble, in times of violence, when students are gunned down at Morgan State University and those who aim the shots are still on the loose, when the number of mass shootings in our country ticked up to 538 this year because of two more shootings this weekend, and when nine-year-old King Javier Black is accidentally killed by a friend who was playing with an unsecured firearm in times of trouble. In times of trouble, of government upheaval, when officials are saying there is no end in sight for the GOP chaos ahead of the divisive Speaker of the House race, when the leading candidate for the President of the United States has 91 felony charges against him, when the U.S.-Mexico border wall will get taller and longer because the Biden administration was unsuccessful in getting funds reallocated in times of trouble, in times of natural and civic disasters, when floods are drowning neighborhoods, fires are decimating cities, hurricane alerts causing PTSD for those who are in Sandy and Katrina, when health insurance costs are rising, when Puerto Ricans pay into Social Security but don't get the benefits, when people are dying of fentanyl overdoses, and when the number of families experiencing homelessness in our city has increased by 120% in one year in times of trouble. And in times of your personal trouble, when you have lost your job, when your hours have been cut, when your marriage is on shaky ground, when your child is struggling in school, when your stress levels are way above high, when your partner just received a diagnosis, when you cannot sleep because of grief, when your body aches from arthritis, when you're so depressed you don't know who to call, when you're angry inside and you don't know why, when you're bone-weary exhausted just from life, when you have failed the big test, lost out on the audition, gotten cut from the team, when you feel like you have more doubts than faith and nothing in your life is going right. When all of this is true and when chaos is crashing in, what will we do? The psalmist asks. Therefore, we will not fear. We will not be afraid. We will not back down, hunker down, stay silent. We will not avoid the difficult conversation. We will not lose hope. We will not stop praying. We will not stop sending aid to those in need. We will not put our own interests above those needing housing, food, health care, and hope. We will not stop rebuilding and revisioning. We will not stop advocating for gun safety or looking people in the eye. We will not stop searching for the cure. We will not stop advocating for fair pay and benefits. We will not stop applying for that job. We will not stop our crying and our lamenting. We will not stop finding joy. We will not stop celebrating and encouraging. We will not stop making a difference. We will not stop focusing on what we can do. We will not fear. Even though, the psalmist says, the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. In the mind of the writer, this is like uprooting the Rocky Mountains, 
pulling them up from Colorado, going over Utah, Nevada, California, and dropping them in the Pacific Ocean. Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Have you thought about that image? What that means? This is a reversing of creation, a doomsday image, a climate change nightmare. The ground is shaking from below, and Lord have mercy, the sky is falling from above. And then the psalmist says, right after verse three in italics, Selah. Which means, in Hebrew, maybe potentially many different things. Maybe it means breath, maybe break, maybe musical interlude, maybe pause, maybe a space of eternity. It's a hard word to define, that's why it's not actually translated into English in the Bible, it's just transliterated. But something about it means to stop, to pause. And with such a pause, we can wake up from the nightmare that is our reality, from all that has just been voiced in the text and begin dreaming a new dream, a vision of hope that cannot be imagined unless we're out of the nightmare and give ourselves a chance to be creative and hopeful. Verse four, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Now you may guess that the psalmist is talking about Jerusalem here, and he is, but there is no river in Jerusalem. <laughs> this is but a mere vision in the psalmist's mind of the refreshing provision of God running through the midst of a chaotic and busy city. The psalmist intellectually knows that God is in the midst of the city, that God has promised presence with every new sunrise, Despite the fact that the nations are in uproar and the kingdoms are tottering, the Lord of hosts, the God of Jacob, is our refuge, our safe place, our saving grace. The psalmist knows this in his head, but he can't feel it in his heart. So he imagines a stream of cool water cutting through the chaos perhaps thinking of Psalm 23. Selah, pause, break, breath. Verse eight and nine, come and behold, come and see, see what the Lord does, he makes wars cease, he breaks the bow, shatters the spear, burns shields, and then verse 10, the capstone of it all. Be still and know that I am God. Now, for so long, I thought that this is a verse that I might say during a morning meditation, coffee cup in hand, looking at the sunrise. Maybe it's a mantra that I have for myself when I'm in yoga. We often think of this verse as meaning that, you know, the presence of God comes to us when we are still, when we can tap into the holy. But that's not what's happening here. This psalm is describing chaos, the worst of the worst natural disasters and human created calamities. The psalmist has just detailed for us the reality of our world with alarming relevance. And the whole psalm is in the third person until this verse, and all of a sudden the voice of God cuts through and in in the first person. Be still and know that I am God. I am God. Not not you, I am God. Remember me, the great I am? God speaks to us directly in this moment to say, I am God and you are not. I am exalted among the nations, not you or your nation. I am exalted in the earth, not you or your ego or your agenda. I am God. And I'd just like to say that I think the reason we struggle sometimes to feel God's presence is that we focus too much on our feelings. This is coming from an Enneagram 4 who loves feelings. I love the feelings wheel. I love all the feelings, but let's be real. Feelings are not reliable, are they? Our feelings do not always speak the truth of our reality. They just 
state how we feel about something. It's a very modern thing to say, you know, I'm just not feeling it, right? Or I can't feel that, so I don't believe it to be true. I mean, think about it. You can feel sad about a breakup even though you know that's the right thing for your life. You can even feel really upset that someone's mad at you because of that look they gave you in staff meeting, but not even realize that maybe that person is going through something and that look had nothing to do with you. Our feelings can sometimes be twisted. We can even feel happy, maybe, that someone we don't like is suffering. And we can even feel extra patriotic and justified then in retaliation or violence, even though, even though we know we're not supposed to kill. And we can feel full of shame, even though we know that God loves us, right? Our feelings do not always indicate reality. So from this passage, the truth for us, Calvary, is that we have to trust that no matter what is happening in our lives, in our world, or our circumstances, we have to trust that God is with us. And I don't care what word you use for God, use divine or creator or being or soul, whatever that is, as Parker Palmer says, that is with us. That's the gospel, right? Emmanuel, God with us. If that is not true, then what is? Our spiritual health depends upon us putting our full trust in knowing that God is with us. Whether we see it, feel it, experience it or not. I was thinking about this this week on the plane when they said, you know, should something happen, the oxygen mask is gonna drop down, you're gonna put it on, and don't worry if the bag doesn't inflate, oxygen is still flowing. Does anybody else think about that? Well, like, what do you mean it's not gonna inflate? Like, shouldn't there be oxygen in that? I hope I never have to discover or find out. But it's just like that. You may not know that oxygen is flowing, but it is, they tell you. You may not feel that God is present and with you, but God is with you, with us, in all of it. And if you have trouble accepting that, that knowing God is God, maybe just back up and stop with be still. And if you can't be still, then just be. Maybe that's where our soul wellness begins. Amen.